it's been fascinating um and as polly said there you know there's just so much uh, different types and aspects of data that we've seen from uh, more static to dynamic to the social data and how they all come together i'd really like to come to clive actually to um uh, to hear his perspective on what he's heard today and on what that might mean for wales well, certainly from a, a sort of small town mayor of a population of 4,000, I thought all three speakers are excellent. It's another level to what we're doing, you know, uh, with what Ed said with the, the, the data that he has. Uh, what we did in a simplistic way was create something called a place plan. Um, and we just used uh, the data from the, the system we have to generate the, the spatial information that we know what we needed to spend on budget and policy. Um, and then we've got three linked communities to the main urban part of Cardigan. We've got uh, three villages on the outskirts. And so at the moment, we're doing like um, what they call active travel for those that are from Wales, looking at active travel um, inquiries and um, engagement to see what's needed in terms of the links between the towns. But the data we don't have is how many people use buses and things like that. We don't have that information about what kind of uh, pattern there is between uh, the villages and the time of day and things like that. So, you know, this sort of stuff is really fascinating uh, in terms of, of of that sort of thing. And then with with uh, what uh, Sharon presented, very similar stuff to what we're doing, but again at another level. Um, <laughs> uh, we we have a a single active area which is the town. Um, and uh, but I'd love to be able to break it down to look at the heritage element of the town to see how much that attracts new visits to compare to the shopping area and also to to the the more uh, sort of uh, suburban part of, of, of the town. Uh, for example, in just a key point from my point of view is that um, at the moment I, I, we spent about 50 to 100,000 on redeveloping play areas in the town and I'm just finishing off a second project now uh, and I'm only basing it on footfall so I don't know the kind of demographics and frequency of use and things like that so I don't know enough about that but hopefully you know uh, and being able to get more information on how, how we do that, that that would be able to uh, influence how we do policy and budgets in, in the town um, but it, it's great to see uh, the level of information that is possible you know we, we use dwell time and footfall and we can see the patterns and the tourists when they come in and when they go um and so we, we you know base our decisions on that so and on that by the way that what we do by the way just in case you didn't know we, we send out information to all the businesses uh, there's 120 shops uh, in cardigan and they all get information every month um which is translated this data into footfall and you know frequency dwell time how many people are coming into town how often they're staying there and things like that so it's fascinating that this level of information and then with with what um uh polly had then wow <laughs> um and you're probably right about um the the 28 percent. i think that's true here um uh, from a local perspective um and uh, probably parts of other parts of wales um you know i saw one sh clothing shop uh, suddenly become much more active social media wise and she started doing a fashion show on instagram and on online and she's now been on tv twice as a result of doing that uh, and so it's it's brilliant that They've now grasped the nettle of, you know, being frightened of the internet. I think he's going to be a competitor to the high street, but instead they've embraced it and said it's just another channel to market for them. And and what I'm excited about in in the year ahead in terms of the context of the town is that so much more is happening online, um, that now becoming more aware about um, in, uh, Instagram and Facebook and things like that, and they're doing much more click and collect going on at the moment something that didn't happen two years ago or even last year before COVID. So this accelerated um, that sort of channel to market and the online side for, for the town, definitely. And I'm quite excited that that then would be a draw to the town. I think you mentioned, uh, one of the speakers mentioned that there are people who are quite good on, on social media and then attracting people into the town and there's a secondary spend happening there because they've attracted those people into the town. So yeah, really, really good and fascinating. I've learned a lot. <laughs> Thank you very much. Great, yeah. And and actually, uh, I just wanted to come back to a couple of the questions that we've got. Um, so one of them that's been posed is around um, uh, coming back to actually what Ed was saying about using that spatial analysis for certain purposes. 
Um, and, uh, and the attendee says, uh, you know, the Welsh Government is also interested in 30% of people working from home within their communities and, and remote working hubs. And um, presumably this tool could be used to suggest where these hubs could be located to have maximum impact. So, so I think that's a, a really interesting thing to discuss around uh, uh, the, the, you know, is, is work a missing component of the high street and actually strategically where should you cite those hubs to be very complementary? Yes, uh, definitely. Uh, in, in the context of uh, where we are here, um, I think that we lost Clive. Yeah. Clive, you've gone on mute. Clive, you've gone on mute. Yeah. Uh... There we go. Sorry. Hello. Um, yeah. Let me just get rid of that. Yeah. In the, in the context of where we are, you're right. Um, looking at footfall and things like that generally, you know, in the other town centre would be ideal for, for our situation, uh, remote working or within two or three miles, you know, if we can avoid using the car. Um, so again, the link communities in, in Cardigan are all within two or three miles from the town centre. We've got this green space around the town, but there are these the commuting villages that we have, there's three of them. Um, so I'd happily cycle into to Cardigan, to, to the hub, just to be to have some social life, you know, <laughs> be able to mix and share a photocopier. <laughs> um, so that, that would be ideal, really. And, and, and the bus routes, then. It, it's, this information that Ed is providing would be ideal for what we're, we're looking for, definitely. Yeah, and, and Ed, I don't know if you want to comment on that. I know um, we, when we had the briefing call, it was uh, one of those um, things that we discussed, wasn't it? Mm. Yeah, I mean, the thing that um, we had been thinking about during lockdown was... Um, yeah, some people are able to work from home and it's okay, but not everybody can. Some people will have to go back to work. But um, the big questions, I mean, if you look at a big city like London, it's where is then the risk of people coming to contact? It's places like public transport. So how do you work with a reduced capacity? How do you still allow people to get to work when they really have to? Um, how do you um, kind of reserve or protect public transport for people that have no other option because you can get people to walk and cycle but that, and that's fine if you can walk or cycle but if you can't then you're stuck as well um, what we looked at was where were there naturally parts in cities which were easy to get to by public transport but also by active and public transport or sorry by active transport and if you get this um, I mean the, the idea was that you might live on the edge of a city, you might need to get a train in a certain distance. And then when you're close enough to the center, you could cycle the last two kilometers or five kilometers. And so there are strategic points in cities that you can find where the public transport network happens to intersect with a bit of the street network, which is more walkable. And that transfer from one mode to another can be an opportunity. Um, you might get people transferring and keeping on moving into the center, but you also might get people staying there. Um, if you look at London, those places tend to be local high streets. And um, one of the really interesting things is um, would be to think about um, could you start to make small scale shared workspaces in those hubs? And there's then going to be a kind of a longer term question, which is uh, what then is the, the kind of future role of high streets? And for a long time, they have been quite focused on retail. But if they're the parts of the city that people or parts of towns and places that people naturally walk through on their way to someone else, they're really places that encourage social interaction. And it's just that retail uses have made the have really exploited there being people there to be able to have shops and sell things to. So I think there's a really interesting long term question about what's the future of high streets as retail. Some of it does shift online. What then happens to those spaces which are left? Do they become more social? Do they become is it about a different kind of work? Is it about um, a new mix of part working from home, part working around other people? And I mean, there's what one of the things that COVID has made really clear is just the benefit of being in the same room at the same time as other people. And that's really, really difficult to um, for a whole series of different types of kind of creative tasks. It's just really, really difficult. So I think there's there's an interesting question about how do all those things come together and how do we look at high streets in the in the longer term as well? Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks very much for that, Ed. And then just uh, going to another question, which actually I think um, uh, goes on to what, what Sharon was talking about as well, was um, what what city or town data do you wish existed that would help your model? And, and Sharon talked about, you know, that thinking about the data that's missing and, and actually to any of the panellists, um, you know, what what data uh, would would you like to see that would really enhance these models? 
Um, I could speak up first if you like. Um, I think, I mean, I, my interest is ultimately in mobile data and sense data sources, you know, and looking at ways we can build models from them. But I just think in terms of driving policy decisions, we need to be aware that they don't give us everything. So there's a real push at the moment for big computational models of masses and amounts of you know, quantitative data, but actually it's still worth investing some time at getting into that qualitative data and the more traditional means of acquiring it, whether it's through surveys, through people on the ground, asking people, getting to the people that maybe aren't being captured when you are sensing effectively somebody carrying a mobile device in their pocket and it being picked up by sensors around the town or because they've installed an app that will share readings so that you can start to do some kind of spatial analysis. We know that's skewed heavily towards younger people and towards professional people. So it's good for generalizations and it's good for targeting services that also they need, but that doesn't make an entire town. So we need to still think that there's probably going to be a number of traditional means uh, to acquire data for other groups that aren't as well represented. And unfortunately, that does mean that it's generally the challenge is it's more expensive to get that data. You know, we can get we can install an app, app and then we can generate millions and pounds, millions of records and analyze it very, very cheaply. Whereas to actually have researchers on the ground, you know, that are qualified to be able to have the kinds of conversations to get those insights becomes a lot more expensive. The benefit of the mobile data is it can help drive the questions, you know, in terms of you can start to learn the footfall and the dwell spots and the areas that are being used or the areas that are not being as used as you expected to. And that can then help frame the sorts of questions you want to ask at a more qualitative level. So you can actually lead to better quality surveys as a result, rather than starting off with the game, mm, what questions should we ask? So use that mobile data to help structure a better survey, but certainly from policy decisions, decision making do still consider there's going to probably still be some more qualitative approaches needed yeah that's that's a really good point actually to be very inclusive about um you know where we're getting the the data and who we're getting the data from i think is, is a is an important point um, i'm very conscious of time uh, i think there's just one last question um that i'd like to pose uh, the, the social data to Polly, um, and it was a question about um, the seventy-two percent of businesses not on social. Um, you know, what are the reasons do we think in in Wales uh, is for that? And, and perhaps between Polly and, and Clive, you know, you might be able to start to answer this. Is it lack of of, of poor con or, or poor connectivity, um, or is it other things? Um, certainly, we've touched on the skills aspect there. So, Polly, I don't know in general whether you want to talk about that and maybe. Clive specifically uh, yeah great question uh, look I think it's uh, you know, as individuals um, we're all happy using social media and we, you know we use it to sort of greater or lesser extents but suddenly when you're talking as a business people it's almost it's almost like sort of 30 years ago when when only a few people in a business had a phone you know it's given to one person in an organization or it's given to an agency and actually it's a very personal thing and a biz businesses have to become social it's not something you just outsource so it is genuinely a skills gap of people just not understanding how to sell using this channel. Um, and you know, consumers have run off the pitch of the ball. They're now living in this environment that businesses have not really entered. And the longer they're not in it, the, the bigger the, the, the bigger the perceived barrier is. So the key thing that, that we do and the reason we work with High Street Task Force is that we, by collecting all that data, we say to people, look, it's not actually about what you post. It's about how you respond. So, you know, life's a conversation, right? And social media is just a place to have a conversation. So we believe that by being able to aggregate data together, show towns what they look like. And somebody goes, well, I'm not there. And you go, well, no, you're not there because you're not, you're not part of the conversation. And if you, don't want to, if you don't want to post something today, well, just join the other conversations, join the, great, jo join the conversation the restaurant's having and make it more matter of fact because social media is not about what you say, it's about how you engage. Um, and it's 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 a, it's an it's a skill that businesses need to learn at scale. Yeah, totally agree with that. Um, it, it's I don't think it's infrastructure. Um, you know. Uh, People think, uh, you know, it's the broadband and all that. You don't need that kind of bandwidth. And we've got it now in Wales, I think. It is skills. Um, I'll give you an example. Over Christmas, I did a, a campaign uh, where I promoted all the online shops that were available in Cardigan. And I got bombarded then by people saying, well, my shop's on, not on there. But I said, well, you haven't got a shop. You've got a Facebook page, but you're just saying what your sister did and things like that. Um, you know, it, it wasn't a business-focused Facebook page. 
And so suddenly they realize I'm not there in the context of my business and they sort of sharpened up a little bit then. And so that added um, um, sort of to the to that sort of channel to market then in, in the town. So yeah, I think it is a skills gap. Um, and um, I know there's Superfast Business Wales uh, are sort of trying to fill that gap with, with their, what they're doing. And also before many years, something called Opportunity Wales, which helps the whole e-commerce agenda improve in Wales as well. So yeah, I think it's down to skills. Okay, that's great. Thanks very much. Um, we have uh, quite a few more questions and we'll uh, aim to get those answered for you. Um, but for now, I'm going to hand back to uh, David. Thanks. 